Hey, everybody, welcome to this extra special episode of the Ron for Tea Show. And I know you're saying, well, Ron, aren't all of your episodes special? And they are special, but this one's extra special because, you know, there are those moments in your life that um, really do something to you. You know, the birth or the death of a loved one, meeting that special someone or seeing that band that changes everything for you. Just changes everything everything and the date for me was may 10th 1996 some friends and i went up to the todd weir center that's on the milwaukee school of engineering campus and we went to go see seam and compound red we had no idea about any band that would be opening called mineral no band from austin texas called mineral but yet after they hit their first note and they finished their first song we kind of forgot the compound red and seam were there and that's not a knock on compound red and it's not a knock on seam but mineral just did something they hit differently and uh everything changed for me at that point and uh, i want to share this episode with you because it's one i've been wanting to do since i was 16 years old so it's a long time coming so uh stick around for my interview with Chris Simpson from Mineral, The Gloria Record, and uh, Mountain Time. This is the Ron Perti Show. So yeah, I really I, I thank you again for being on. This is uh, this actually means a lot to me. I love that. Yeah, um, yeah, I like to hear that. You know, I, um, I I've been doing a lot of thinking once when you agreed to come on, and I remember it was May tenth of nineteen ninety six is when I first saw you. Okay, where was that? Yeah, the Todd Weir Center in Milwaukee, uh, Wisconsin. Uh, With Seam, maybe? What's that? With Seam? With Seam and uh, Compound Red. Yep. Yeah, I remember that. And I went to go see Compound Red. And Seam was a bonus. And I didn't even think about anybody else on the bill. And then you guys get up there. And I didn't care about Compound Red and Seam after that. (laughs) I just totally didn't. And I remember Jeremy broke a bass string during that set. Sure. But I forget which song, but the way he plays, it could have been any of them. Yeah. That's usually Scott's territory, but Jeremy actually used to break a lot of strings too. Yeah. Back in the original run. I don't that know what was, those guys were doing, but. Yeah. It was, it was like so weird to see somebody break a, break a bass string because mm-hmm. they're so you know thick and, and, and everything. But uh, so going back, um, I know you never probably thought when you were writing the songs that you would have like this everlasting uh, impact on so many people. I mean, what does that feel like now? It feels great. You know, I think, uh, yeah, maybe we didn't think that would happen, but I feel like I'm always aware of that possibility with music, you know, because, uh, really you know like you put out a record and even if nobody buys it or nothing really happens with it in the moment like there's just it's out there you know it's in the ether and like there's always a possibility that more and more people will discover it over time um like you've created this artifact that nobody can entirely erase from existence you know right no that's that's for sure and uh i did love when um the collection came out with everything in one that was fantastic because i hated yeah. having to keep switching cds mm-hmm. it's like could you yeah. please no okay um uh, now i know i remember back in the day when you guys were first started performing it's not so much now when you watch videos like i think it uh i think i saw somebody's like phone footage from furnace fest um Back in the day, you guys played with your back to the audience. Was that a conscious decision or was that just something that happened? I mean, because I know 
a lot of your lyrics are very introspective and the, everything's very heartfelt. And was it just a matter of being kind of apprehensive? I think that was certainly some of it. Um, I think, yeah, like it felt like the, it's how we practiced, you know, and uh -huh. wrote, like in a room together all in like a semicircle, like facing the drummer. Okay. Um, and at some point, you know, we didn't always play that way live, but like anytime, I, I think actually, you know, Jeremy was almost always had his back turned, um, which makes sense, you know, for the bass player, like, you know, blocking in with the drummer. Um, and I just felt more comfortable that way in between uh, turns singing at the vocal mic, you know? Um, right. And I do remember a, uh, it's funny, like when Power Filling came out and we started getting this buzz and like major labels calling, um, I do remember one show we played in uh, LA where there was a bunch of label people there. Um, and it just felt, I, I actually had an experience like in the moment while we were playing of like, I don't want to be playing for these people. I want to be playing for ourselves. So I actually like turned the mic around to be oh, facing wow. the drums and finished the set that way. Um, it wasn't, always like that you know that's one instance I can think of that it felt like a like a decision or a choice um on my part consciously but uh in general I think we just felt comfortable that way like yeah like it was um it did it felt like very intimate music and lyrics and uh it felt like something that uh I don't know. It's it's interesting. Like we we, I don't think we really had the sense of like back then of wanting to connect with people, um, mm -hmm. which is you know was such a wonderful part of the reunion tours we've done. Is like really coming back to it with a little more maturity and and you know really being grateful for the connection our music has had with so many people and wanting to in the moment connect with those people you know at the time it felt much more like uh in the original days like felt much more like insular or like uh us against the world kind of thing you know right no i totally get that i totally understand that um i noticed with a lot of your lyrics um it's actually funny because the high school i went to we had senior pages that we could put whatever we wanted on them and I actually put some of the lyrics to slower on there and I misquoted them and nobody knew what I was talking about except for like four people and mm -hmm. I, they would not let me live it down. Okay. Um, but it was, it was totally worth it. You know, it was totally <laughs> worth it because I got to expose all these people in my high school who were listening to God knows what at the time to something amazing. Um, now, I noticed a lot of the lyrics, uh, especially on um, the second album, they seem to be rooted in in faith as uh, is is faith a big thing was it a big thing for you then now i mean is it more like is it a day-to-day -day thing for you or is it just kind of come out in the lyrics it was at the time uh it's interesting that you pick up more of it on the second record it, it's definitely there um to me i feel like the first record has the most like sort of unabashedly kind of spiritual angle um in a lot of the lyrics but i yeah i you know grew up going to church not like any uh sort of holy roller kind of thing but um my parents went to a lutheran church and you know we we always went and at some point i got really really into it and i got into a lot of christian music and uh was very involved in youth group and uh, it was definitely like the biggest part of my identity uh, kind of coming out of high school. Like, and I think Mineral was sort of bridged this period of time where I was not living at home anymore. I wasn't really going to church. Like I didn't, and I, I actually think in, in reality, I was kind of moving away from it at that time, mm -hmm. but it was 
something that I was very much preoccupied with this sort of anxiety about that. And uh, it really came out, you know, in the lyrics was kind of the main place I deal with that, I guess. Did you, are you, are you still, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> are you still uh, a spiritual person or have you, like you said, walk kind of stepped away from that? Sure, I definitely am. I, and what I mean is I stepped away, I think, from uh, a sort of organized, like, uh, proclamation of Christian faith. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that period of time informed what has been a lifelong sort of spiritual search and yearning. And uh, yeah, I read extensively in uh, different world religions and viewpoints and uh it's still very much something that is of great interest to me um but it's not something that i have any sort of uh like i don't go to a church or um it's not something that i do um in the ways i did back then it's much more of a i guess internal um kind of uh journey hmm. right no that makes sense that makes yeah. sense that makes sense so what would and i'm sure you've been asked this before but ultimately what was what what came what brought the end because we have so much to cover in such a little bit of time what what kind of ultimately brought the initial end of mineral around yeah so i was uh you know i think the the whole process of like kind of blowing up in, in a sense, you know, after Power of Failing and having all the major label interests like uh, and signing with a major label uh, really, I think exposed some divides in the band as far as just like, I don't know, I, I didn't really, I didn't really want that, I don't think. Um, right. I think I was much more wary of uh, losing this this little intimate like thing that we had you know um and and very you know probably unnecessarily like uh determined to fight against being packaged or marketed or um so i had a lot of like this desire to keep doing things the way we were doing them you know the way we had started doing them right and within the band, you know, like there was, obviously it was a wonderful opportunity that we were given. And, you know, it was more than just, I mean, it really was, I can, I can look back now and say like a pretty amazing opportunity. We had the actual like presidents of Interscope Records wanting to sign us and like people who were like, not like some lowly A&R guy who was going to be gone by the time we ever put out a record with the label, you know, we had like, some really big people in the industry like interested in uh you know taking us on and uh but they wanted as most people do like immediate gratification right you know, from a business sense and they wanted to take over power of failing and reissue it and like just take over from there and uh i specifically and we you know i think in general like didn't want some big overnight change so we we ended up signing a deal to go with them on our third record so that we would not only finish the power of failing with crank but do another record with crank first um and you know that was uh yeah i mean i think that that, that just started like this things seemed different you know and then there was i had really struggled with the and serenading to um with writer's block as far as lyrics like we how we operated in Mineral was primarily the music was written by the four of us together in a room um, based on like little seeds of ideas that Scott or I would bring in. Um, and we would get these big, you know, the whole musical arrangement and everything about it, like kind of set before, usually before I ever had any vocals going on it. Mm -hmm. um, and that worked fine on the first record. Um, and I think we had, while touring Power Feeling, we had Unfinished and maybe a letter, like a couple songs from And Serenading. Um, 
sort of worked out that way too like I already had vocals and melodies and lyrics but the rest of the record was just music and I didn't have I didn't know what I wanted to sing I wasn't inspired to sing or write and it just wasn't happening for me and I was really kind of up against a wall and I think that kind of exacerbated the end too like this this feeling that the other people were like we've put all this time and energy into this and you know are you even going to do something with it are you going to finish it uh and so but I think ultimately it came down to myself and Jeremy um both feeling kind of uh just not really interested in doing it anymore like uh well we had toured just so much in such a short amount of time and right right I, I had just uh met and was excited about uh, a new relationship um with uh the woman who is now my wife um and it was early on for us and i i really just wanted to be in one place and uh make sense yeah be able to foster a relationship and uh i wanted to be able to do whatever i wanted to do musically like i i already had these kind of yearnings to do different things musically that and i think some somewhat during the writing process for and serenading i feel like i brought in some ideas that were like you know in the in the comment was made that like yeah it doesn't really feel like mineral you know right. um and that was kind of a red flag for me i was thinking like i mean we're making our second record like have we even defined what we are you know um like we, you we, think by that point it would take at least two or three records to find out who you are as a band sure um i just think i just thought it was important to be able to you know like explore other musical vibes or options and 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 to be fair like it wasn't it wasn't like I was bringing in like folk music or something that like I've I've done a lot of since you know like right. um it just I don't know everything seemed to just kind of unravel you know and I think we were all really really close and really good friends and we had just such a mutual respect for one another that it just felt to me and Jeremy, I think, like we should just, you know, end it now. Like you didn't, <laughs> almost like you didn't, like you wanted to keep the friendships so the band had to suck to sacrifice so you guys could remain friends type of thing. Yeah, yeah, it did feel that way a bit. And and it was hard. It was like we, you know, Jeremy and I really let Scott and Gabe down. Like, they, you know, we had just signed this big record deal and we're, they were really excited, you know, uh, and so there was a lot of pain involved in it uh, amongst us. Um, but yeah, I think it was just a matter of like wanting different things in the moment or already growing kind of apart, you know? Right. Did you, now did any of the songs that you brought to the table for that second record that didn't make it end up being used in the Gloria record? I think some of them may have, yeah. Cause there was such, it was such a tight turnaround between and serenading in that first Gloria record EP. Um, so yeah, it may have, like, I don't remember mm -hmm. offhand, like which pieces this happened with, uh, but yeah, it's it's highly likely that some of that might have uh, been used. Cause I remember, I remember Gloria seeing the Gloria EP. record at the Globe East in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. There's a trend going on here um and midlake opened for you guys oh yeah yeah and it was an and it was an afternoon show there was an afternoon show and a night show i couldn't i was still i want to say i wasn't 21 yet so i couldn't get into the night show so my buddy and i went to like this show at three o'clock in the afternoon and i it was just again blown away i don't think you've put out anything that hasn't moved me to my core uh, and because of that, I became friends with Mackenzie, the drummer from Midlake. So oh, that's awesome. to this that's day, fun. we've been, we're friends. So that's great. Yeah. It's funny. We used to have a joke in the glory record about how we were like the band breaker. Cause we would, uh, like not break in a bad way, like break out, you know, like, right. um, cause for a while there, we had this string of like bands that we took out with us that were, you know, smaller than us at the time who like a year later were like blowing up, you know? 
who else did you go did went out with you that happened to uh i'm trying to think now who it would have been oh uh uh i think her space holiday you remember them oh, yes um and they you know like maybe it was more short-lived for them like their period of success and um but uh uh we were buddies with all these omaha people and like you know like bright eyes opened a few shows oh, for us man. in the uh and never never heard of connor overs before right yeah yeah um yeah so it was fun it was like uh maybe it was a little frustrating at the time it was like but 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 it it uh reinforced it like we have good taste you know right exactly yeah. exactly you know what you're doing you yeah know what you're doing the the lead now before i get into like the 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 songs with the gloria record i did notice something with your lyrics and it, it was the first time i had ever noticed this with any anybody is you don't kind of have a chorus and a hook or anything like that it's almost like you're just telling a story straight through was that a conscious decision or did it just kind of come out that way i think it was more like just came out that way like i I think maybe I just thought I had too much to say, you know, like to right. repeat a chorus, you know, it's like, why would I repeat a chorus when, you know, I could like do more lyrics there, you know? Yeah, no, totally. <laughs> totally makes sense. No, I totally get that. That's, uh, and I, I didn't notice it until after, after like your song structures were introduced to me and then i finally got into the cure that i noticed robert smith does that a lot too mm -hmm. so and i was you know scott was a huge cure guy but i was a big cure guy too like i you know that was definitely formative stuff for us as far as and i loved that about them like that there weren't courses but i think it was something that i always did because i played uh when i lived in denver before i moved down to texas um i played in a uh like a death metal band <laughs> um, with some buddies and uh it was never like my like this is my music you know like right. I, love this, I love this kind of music but I definitely got into it and knew about it and I had friends who did that and it was like an opportunity to be in a band um which was exciting to me and uh I I remember the at this little studio where we were recording a demo like the engineer guy at the studio making that same comment back then He's like, I love that you don't have traditional choruses. You're like, there's different lyrics each time, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think it's something that I've kind of always done or, you know, and certainly I've, I've moved more towards, uh, you know, like I love a good chorus now, but at the time I was, uh, yeah, everything had to be different, you know? But um, I am not complaining about that at all, <laughs> at all. I know to this day, um, whenever a, a friend of mine will say, oh, well, you know, I'm into emo and I'm into like, you know, my chemical romance. I'm like, oh, and I don't know if it makes me feel old that, you know, I was around when Sunny Day was out, when you guys were around and stuff like that. And do, what is your take on, on that label, the emo label? I don't think we ever loved it, you know, like, right. it, uh, I think the, the, predominant reason for that is that it always felt <clears throat> at the time when we were actually around as a band it, like it felt kind of demeaning almost right you know like uh oh these little emo guys you know like all sensitive and emotional you know as if like music hasn't always been emotional or something and we exactly introducing that you know like um so yeah it, it to us it felt a little denigrating like at the time um and i think that was certainly before it was like it sort of became subsumed into the mainstream in the way it did with like the early 2000s and bands like my chemical romance you know where uh it, i think it meant something different by then you know oh um, yeah and so as the 2000s wore on like and i saw like what it what it meant you know to people and who was being labeled as that it was like well i i didn't start that you know like i wasn't I wasn't a part of the beginning of that like yeah uh so i think there was a, always been kind of a distancing from it for us but but certainly as we've gotten older and the reunion tours and whatnot like you know i think we've made peace with it like you really can't control what other people call whatever you do you know right and if that, that, it just seems like a silly hill to die on you know 
Yeah, no, definitely. I definitely understand that. Um, and I know when, you know, when Gloria record came, I remember reading in milk magazine, how you got, how Gloria record got their name. I don't know if you remember milk magazine. Oh yeah. Jim, I, uh, James Miner from compound red. Yep. And, uh, yep. Yeah. I was reading it and I was on the couch reading it and I had just started my own zine and I was just like, Oh, I wish I had interviewed all these people. And I remember I, Oh, his name is escaping me now, but it was the drummer for the Gloria record. And he just said, all right, let's play that Gloria record. And it's like, Oh, boom. Yeah. Matt. Um, boom. It just happened. Uh, so yeah, our friend Matt played drums on the first uh, Gloria record EP um, as we were sort of getting that band together. And he was also uh, ironically, the original drummer in Mineral, who never ended up being on any recordings, but he's a good friend of ours that we've played music with off and on. Um, and I wanted to call it Gloria, you know, I mean, I, you've read the story in there, but um, right. And so I kept <clears throat> referring to it as Gloria and <clears throat> I wasn't really sure if that name was going to stick or, but that's just kind of how I was referring to this new project. And so he was like, when are we going to make the Gloria record? You know, like, yeah. and just hearing him say it like that, I'm like, oh yeah, that's a better name, you know. Did you know, so <laughs> the song Gloria had a big impact. It was very, it was one of your, one of the songs that was really close to you. Yeah, for sure. And uh, in writing it and calling the song that, like, I really felt this like lineage, like one of the first visceral memories I have of realizing like, I want to do that regarding music. Mm -hmm. was that movie the outsiders right um these all of these books by essie hinton like i was obsessed with um and when i saw the outsiders movie there's a scene early on in it where the guys are just like kind of strutting like i'm gonna go walking on the town you know see what's going on tonight and uh the song gloria by them uh van morrison's band before he went solo is in there and it was just so like eye-opening it blew my mind like that song is so powerful and like just that way that he <clears throat> he's singing but he's also kind of screaming at you and like it's just, it's almost like terrifying almost you know um that I loved that song and then I had a huge U2 phase and they have a song called Gloria that I loved and so to me it just felt like this like continuation of a lineage almost you know like um, and it also, you know, with my religious background, like had, you know, additional sort of meaning and weight. Right. Right. So basically we have Van Morrison and you two to thank for mineral. Basically. Yeah. Okay. All right. Just so they know, <laughs> just so Bono knows Yeah. that, mm -hmm. you know, um, now when it comes to the Gloria record, that stuff seemed to be to me, at least maybe it just hit me differently that it seemed way more introspective than the mineral stuff like and, and and almost like you were able to kind of branch out way more than you ever had been given a chance before i mean how did that hit differently did it like did it was it freeing to you to be able to write like that yeah it was um it was freeing to yeah like it, it did feel like uh i could kind of bring anything to uh this uh this band you know like right. musically and we could make something out of it um so it felt like there was more freedom musically but also i mean just like you know especially once we got uh ben in the band on keyboards like it felt like just this you know our palette was so much wider you know like we could we had access to so many more sounds and uh and you know in addition to that the ben just being an incredible musician and like a, a sort of you know a, a born kind of jazz player like he could kind of do anything um and that really opened up the door for us to do like i feel like to do whatever we wanted and and uh but I will say lyrically, like what I picked up on in your question and what I've noticed about the Glory Record in retrospect is that, and about myself is that I, you know, I was just severely depressed for a long time. Um, and on, you know, somehow unaware of it. Um, and I mean, I was aware of it obviously, but uh, unaware that that's what I was, 
talking about and writing about, you know? So right. I think there's a lot less hope <laughs> in a lot of the, the glory record lyrics, you know? Um, there was a song called my funeral party. So, I mean, that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That, that doesn't exactly ex exude um, let's go party with streamers yeah. and a party hatch. Yes. Yes. But it's still amazing. And I, and I, and my favorite part of the glory record is the fact that uh, stuff from the first EP, even to this, the low in traffic um, EP are like almost two completely different records. And then mm -hmm. the feet and then the full length, are they're all just so different and i loved that things were able to kind of expand and just be amazing and i remember when the, the full length came out i was supposed to go see you guys at the metro in chicago and you were playing with national skyline mm -hmm. and we get there and the cubs were playing a night game and we could and i'm from wisconsin you think i, I would know better than to try and drive to chicago on the night a cubs have a night game yeah you can find Rick parking yeah Yes, yeah, so we couldn't find parking. We couldn't get in, wasted our tickets, and we ended oh. up in the borders all night. But oh, what was the inevitable end of the Gloria record, if it has ended? Because, I mean, it, it could conceivably come back, couldn't it? Sure, yeah. Uh, we're all still close. And, um, and the thing is, we made, you know, began making a second full length that... So we have a bunch of music recorded that, again, like I didn't really get to the point of having lyrics and vocals written for it um but there's material there to work with for sure musically um so i got with that i think i um i think it's kind of a similar ending in that like i i again felt like just sort of stuck creatively and uh we were writing all this music for another record and I wasn't really that interested in playing guitar as much as I had before. And, and because of the way we were writing a lot of it in the studio, you know, like Ben would, you know, like just go to town and like stack up two or three like keyboard ideas that just sounded amazing. And like that and bass and drums, like sometimes we would have these like really great sounding pieces of music that I didn't hear what I would do on the guitar on them. and. Uh, I didn't, wasn't necessarily interested in playing the guitar, but I also was like blocked. Like I wasn't writing or coming up with lyrics and vocals that I liked for it. Right, I really right. just couldn't put myself into it, you know, like, um, and it was a very kind of sad and lonely experience for me. And uh, I think I just got to a point where, uh, and I think also I kind of realized around that time that like, I, yeah, I need to like figure out some things about myself as far as like depression and mental health. Like, um, and I proposed that uh, after we had recorded all the music for this record, like I proposed that we take a year off and just, uh, you know, not, not work on it and then come back together and start writing new stuff like right. I, I basically proposed like let's just set this record we've been working on aside um and just people weren't interested in that you know like we actually had worked hard and things were going pretty well for the band and like uh it seemed like there was momentum and it, it made sense like there was people in the band who just weren't interested in waiting and coming back to it and disregarding the work we had been doing um and so it just kind of ended, you know? Um, and there was, you know, Brian, the drummer had moved to Austin to play with us, to join the band um, and didn't love living in Austin and didn't want to live here. And he basically decided like, if this band is not happening or going on hiatus, I'm gonna move, like I'm not gonna be here. Um, so then we just started, uh, you know, that was kind of the beginning of the end. Like he moved away, Ben ended up eventually moving um and it's kind of where it's been like we've we've had several different sessions of like talking and being interested in pulling up the stuff that we started and saying what we could do with it i mean primarily what i could do with it because it's a lot of it's pretty pretty done you know outside of vocals um and 
I've tried a few times, you know, and I, I am genuinely interested in uh, finishing some of this material because it's, I think it's really unique, interesting music. Um, but I just have never succeeded in uh, finding a way to put myself into it, you know? No, I totally understand that. Like, I'll, I'll start writing a script or something and just... I'll make it two pages in and just be done. I can't, I can't go any further and I don't want to go keep going. You know, yeah. almost like I'm forcing myself and you can't, you can't force art. Uh, right. That's yeah. It's something I've uh, realized many times over. Now, what did you, how did you like get out of your, your depression? I mean, obviously depression is something that never really truly goes away. Yeah. Uh, if you, if you have depression, it's not, it's, you just find a way to manage it, I guess. So what was your, mm -hmm. what was the mitigating factors that kind of led to you being able to kind of get over, not over it, but you know what I well, mean? Uh, it, well, it really started with medication. Like I, uh, for me, I, my uh, girlfriend, now wife, like at the time was just like, just kind of yeah, it was like an ultimatum. It's like, you need some help, you know, like you need to find someone to talk to. You need to consider medication. Like, uh, I think it could be really helpful. Like, uh, and she had had an experience. Her father died when she was in high school and she had uh, <clears throat> been really depressed after that. And, you know, taken an antidepressant like medication for a couple of years that really got her through it and kind of turned things around for her. So she was basically a proponent of like, you know, this could be a good thing. Um, and it was just not something that would ever have crossed my mind or I would have thought about, you know, um, or thought of as a possibility. So that, uh, that was the start of it. And then, uh, yeah, just, I mean, I've been basically in various different therapies since then. Um, which I love, like, and I've, you know, psychology is almost like my new spirituality. Like I'm obsessed with it and read a lot in that area. And uh, yeah, I just, I guess I became very curious about these things and, and my own mind, you know? No, I totally understand. Like I'm in therapy, I'm on medication and it's, uh, they're, uh, they're wonderful, wonderful things. My favorite thing though, is when you have, therapy all year and then around christmas your therapist takes two to three weeks off for the holiday so it's almost like you're in training the entire year to try and survive the time that you need them the most yep yeah i've uh i'm actually in in addition to individual therapy now i'm in a group therapy which is really wonderful um and we take every august off i've only been in a couple of years but that's tough, you know, like, it's like get through a whole month, you know, like, yeah, without yeah. something that you come to kind of like, depend on or feel like kind of an anchor, you know? Oh, for sure. So now, getting to where where you are now, I mean, granted, it's where you are now started a little bit, you know, before, obviously. Uh, is it correct me here? Is it mountain time? Or is it zookeeper? Uh, so it's mountain time now. So, uh, okay. uh, you know, right after the glory record, um, so like 2004 to 2008, uh, really till like 2014 when I put up Pink Chalk. Uh, so it was called Zookeeper. And um, I guess the easiest way to say it is that Mountain Time is only a nominal change from Zookeeper. It's the same thing. I just changed the name at some point. Um, it's the same in my mind, body of work. And uh, now, you know, we've reissued the first two Zookeeper records and some bonus tracks on vinyl um, under the Mountain Time name. So it's like... That's the yeah. St. Francis Zookeeper yeah. record? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So it's, to me, it's all Zookeeper, basically. It's all Mountain Time. Because I remember hearing that first Zookeeper record and I was just like, wow, he's done it again. And <laughs> if I remember correctly, it came out on Bell City Records, right? Bell City Pop, yeah. yeah. Uh, Brian, Brian Malone uh, had a little uh a little lapse of reason and decided like maybe <laughs> i should start a record label you know um no he's just always such been such a great friend and uh he was, had moved to new york or he had moved back to north carolina where he was before he moved to austin to join the glory record and then after like a summer there ended up moving up to new york with a couple of friends um and was there for a long time so he was in new york and he was like not really playing music, but really wanting to 
still kind of be involved in music. And so I was making all these recordings and he was like, I'm thinking about starting a label, like let's make a record. Um, yeah, so uh, we did an EP in the full length with him. And uh, I think he put out a couple other things too before realizing like, oh, this is a really hard, hard way to make money. <laughs> What's funny is uh, that's what the city I live in is called. That's its nickname is Bell City. Yeah, he's from Racine. Oh well, see, I don't know these things. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm so yeah. So I uh, so he's he's a Racine, a Wisconsin native. Yep, I'm sitting currently sitting in the north side of Racine. So okay. it's yeah, yeah. It's um, so it wasn't a very long trek to the globe east or to uh, uh you know now did you guys ever pl- i gotta ask this did you guys ever play the fireside bowl oh yeah uh well i'm having trouble remembering if the glory record ever played there but mineral played there quite a bit did you ever run across like when it's really hot did you ever run across the really big cockroaches on the wall i don't it doesn't ring a bell but because i went to go see a band's final show there the place is packed and there's like a cockroach about that big on the mm. back wall and i'm just like oh i'm gonna go stay outside now mm-hmm. i think that's um uh, did you was there a big basement scene when you guys first started off yeah i feel like a lot of the particularly the earlier tours mineral did there was a lot of basement shows and house shows and um yeah i remember um our very first tour, we um, went out with Christy Front Drive, who we had recently like played in Houston with just randomly and kind of, you know, became BFFs and was like a mutual appreciation society. And their their bass player, Carrie, was like, why don't you guys have a seven inch? And we're like, a what? Uh, and he was like, let me put out a seven inch for you. Uh, and why don't you guys tour? And we're like, do what? He's like come on, let's go on tour. Uh, so they really, uh, I think, brought us into, you know, this whole kind of scene of like this DIY network of bands and people. And uh, so, yeah, we did our first tour with them and we played in uh, Kansas City in someone's basement and uh, the Get Up Kids opened for us. I think it was uh, one of their first shows. They might even have still been called the Suburban Get Up Kids. Oh, wow, um, that is so crazy before they dropped uh did to just get up kids um but it was a very memorable night and we actually did this thing with christian front drive where we traded off every other song for our sets uh like we just shared gear and like they played a song then we got up and played a song then they got up and played a song it was really fun that would have been amazing to see and I think I think a lot of the bands, you know, like you guys and Braid and the Get Up Kids and, the, and a, there was a lot of basement shows and house shows going on at that time, because yeah. I remember going to Milwaukee to see quite a few of them at uh, the Bremen House. That's what it was. I forgot. Yeah. When I was talking to Bob last week. I was like, what the name is that house? I'm like, oh, it's the Bremen House. I had to think about it. And it had the most dingiest basement but it was so cool to just be around people who were into the same thing as you. And that's something I think a lot of like smaller acts have kind of lost now as they're coming up is there's no, I I mean, I can't speak for any place else, but Racine and Milwaukee used to have an amazing scene, like that whole kind of Midwest type thing. And now it's just kind of dead, you know? Yeah. Uh, I I was always I kind of always worried about that too. I think I think we might just not know though, you know? Like True. I think it might I've I've met enough people and uh uh you know this whole like emo revival or whatever like uh um the span, I don't know if you've heard of them Empire Empire. I I've heard of them. I don't yeah. Um from Michigan um uh their singer Keith started writing me emails at some point and uh, inviting me out to their shows in Austin. And uh, I got to know him and went to see a few of their shows. And I was like, I think that's when I realized it because every time he would invite me to one of their shows in Austin when they were touring, I'd be like, oh, where are y'all playing? And he'd tell me, I'm like, what the fuck is that? You know, like, right? Uh, where is that? You know, and he's like, oh, it's just some like warehouse on the east side, you know? And like, so I think the whole DIY culture is, probably still happening we just they don't invite old people 
Yeah, no, I totally understand that. I totally get that. If I showed up at a house show now, it would look really <laughs> weird. I'm pretty sure there would be some authorities showing up uh, or people asking for beer. Uh, no, yeah, I mean, there's yeah. a, around here, there was a lot of straight edge people. Yeah, so for sure. Wasn't, yeah, there wasn't a lot of uh, a lot of that. But um, when it, I just got one last question for you. Okay. Just to end on a, on a light note here. What's one thing that people might not expect to know about you uh i'm super funny like stand-up comedian funny that was the best stephen wright-esque delivery <laughs> i've ever heard in my life that was fantastic i'm only half joking <laughs> but which half that's the important part that's the important part uh i want to thank you so much for being here this is something i wish i could have done when i had my first zine back when i was 15 years old um i remember i put the first issue in a coffee shop and i made the mistake of putting my address on it and a band showed up at my front door at eight o'clock at night um pounding on pissed, the door pissed about a bad review no no they were oh. like and i'm in my pajamas <laughs> and they're like they're like I'm like yeah come with get dressed you're coming with us i'm like uh-oh so i went with them and that's when i did my first interview i was 15 years old and I, it was like a surreal and i've been doing it ever since this has been it's and but it's all thanks to you know the, everything that happened you know i mean obviously i hadn't heard you guys when i was 15 because you weren't around yet but uh I remember being, you know, given a Nirvana CD, then given like Diary by Sunny Day. And then the minute we went to the Todd Weir Center and you guys hit that first note, I don't know what it was. You know, I even tried going back and listening to Seam recently because my best friend in the whole world was kind of big in the scene, but he kind of, yeah, well, yeah, whatever, Mark, I know you're listening. Um, he, uh, you know, we we're just like flabbergasted at, at mineral and he's like and he, he was listening to see me he's like you should listen to it again so i put on i'm like yeah it's not power of failing sorry <laughs> it's just not but um so now you just put out a new record last year what or was yeah, the year uh, before uh it's really it's a great question uh <laughs> it was um 2020 i guess was uh um, these years have just kind of folded into they themselves. really have yeah yeah uh tw so may of 2020 june of 2020 uh the first mountain time full length came out music for looking animals and then uh just you know just now basically uh the the double lp uh mountain time that's a, that's a reissue of the um zookeeper albums with some additional stuff on it perfect there you go and that's uh out on spartan right yeah, those are both on Spartan. Okay, so you can find those online. You can listen to them on Spotify. So the minute you're done listening to this interview, go find them on here on Spotify and okay. you can listen to them. Chris, thank you so much for being here. It has been an honor, a pleasure, and any other kind of uh, uh, amazing word I can use. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Ron.